2 and verse 20. And um, I did hear, you know, as Bob mentioned earlier, the ladies had a great time yesterday, and Tammy had a wonderful talk, and so that's, that's good to hear, um, that you were all edified spiritually, fed spiritually, as well as fed physically at the mother-daughter brunch. So is brunch going to become what we do now instead of dinner, or... Well, there you go. That's that's almost you, mammoth and you, mammoth. You, you know, everybody, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees. So there you go. So everybody agrees. So that's that's good. That's good. Well, you were inside. You were inside. I. I, I one of these days, Ned Lee will be trying to get an old man in through the rain, you know, with a cane. So, we'll <laughs> oh, I get to stay home then. All right. Um, and don't forget Father's Day. Bob mentioned this morning that's um, that'll be something a little different that we're trying for Father's Day, which will be good. Um, going to uh, Canoe Creek right after church. We do have a pavilion uh, rented, so it, we plan on doing that rain or shine. So if it's if it's a drizzly day like today. We're still going to do it. Hopefully, it won't be quite as cold as today, but um, we're still going to do it either way, rain or shine. So, kind of set that date aside now, and then sometime in July or August, we'll be doing a curve game. We'll let you know more about that as the time progresses. All right, Galatians chapter two and verse twenty. Uh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live; yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself. For me. Let's bow our hearts now in a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity this morning of looking at your word, of studying it together. And as we do so, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ and be edifying for the saints. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, this morning, we want to kind of wrap up. Um, took a little break last week and thank Bob for filling in for us. It, it, we were hoping Dan would be here, but he had to get back home, didn't work out, um, so it was good to have Bob to fill in. Um, and we're, we're wrapping up, we spent some extended time uh, this year going through our four pillars of, of truth, our four pillars of faith that we build the ministry on, that you can build your life on. And um, some years we just do that in one message, some years we take four weeks and do it, some years this year we decided to expand that a little bit and talk a little more about each of those things because they are things that are good for us to keep in mind, just to keep focused on, on the really important things. Obviously, there's a lot of things we study, a lot of, a lot of rabbit trails we go down to understand you know, the, the finer points of God's Word, but there are these basic truths that we build everything else on, and it's good always to keep those things. Paul says, you know, for me to write the same things unto you uh, is, is needful. For you it is needful, he says, because you got, we, we all need to be reminded. I need to be reminded of it by teaching it. We need to be reminded of it by hearing it taught, um, these basic truths that we understand. And of course, those four are, and we're going we're gonna to get to that, that one this morning. Um, you know, we, we, we go through the list all the time, um, and it starts with a book you can trust. I'm just putting the key words up here, so just to save time writing it all out. Putting the key words um, up here, so just to save time writing it all out. I hear a voice. I, it, sounds, it sounds familiar, too. It sounds familiar. So um, it starts with a book you can trust. <clears throat> we move on then to a gospel you can believe. And, of course, believe, and, and that, that points to the importance of faith, believing what the book you trust says. Then we move on to study that you can understand. You need to be able to understand the, the, the God's truth, and understand the world around you, understand the universe, understand salvation, redemption, all, all those things. And then finally, that leads to a life you can live, which is where we get this verse, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. <coughs> and as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, when we were, uh, you know, uh, wrapping up this this idea of a life you can live, and and when we talk about that, the way I oftentimes introduce that is by saying, if your theology or your philosophy or your belief system, whatever, however you want to label it, um, if, if if what you what you are counting on and what you are trusting in doesn't get you to a life you can live, then it really is of little value. 
because in the end we all have to go out and live our lives we all live on this planet we all have to interact with each other and with systems on this planet and with the world around us and good things bad things family friends enemies whatever the case might be we all have to be able to go out and face that so you know it, it, however many points you have or however many beliefs you have it has to end up here it has to end up with a life you can live or what's the point of it if it doesn't end up with a life you can live um, and so we talked about that and and then along with that <coughs> about that same time um, there was a, a video just released on YouTube we're gonna watch it here in a minute. it's only like eight minutes long so we're gonna watch the whole thing and it was released on Easter um, the the occasion of this video being released was Easter Sunday um, and it's a British a British broadcasting network um, that is it up yeah that woman is is a you know a, a, an anchor on a British broadcasting network and she's going to interview so so it's Easter so of course they're talking about religious things um, this is all in England so you got to remember England is they're either further down the drain than we are all right spiritually speaking so just keep that in mind as you, as you listen to her and all that and she is interviewing a very famous atheist called named Richard Dawkins and uh, Keith if you were here for the first service Keith played some videos of Richard Dawkins just to give you an idea of what his philosophy is and what his understanding is I'll just just summarize it you know and I, I thought you know as, as Keith was playing those Keith introduced the videos by saying Richard Dawkins is a is a famous atheist and I thought you know of all the things I'd like to be famous for uh, well not really I really wouldn't want to be famous anyhow but if I wanted to be famous the last thing I would want to be famous for is being an atheist you know, there's a whole lot of things you can be famous for that are better than being famous for being an atheist so but Richard Dawkins Keith Wright that's his claim to fame he's an atheist and you know he debates uh, Keith played a couple debates in the, in the first service between him and John Lennox who's a very famous uh, Christian apologist and and he debates atheist this if you if you're familiar with Christopher Hitchings Hitchings was another famous atheist uh, in England and Hitchings and Dawkins are very very similar in their belief and, and their understanding of things Hitchens maybe even more so but the point of this video is not to promote Richard Dawkins or atheism but it's it's kind of make to make this point a, a, a life you can live that if what you believe so Richard Dawkins is an eight doesn't believe that there is a God he's a he's an evolutionary biologist by profession by trade but got involved in debating Christians uh, creating theists anybody that believes that there's a God he'll debate them doesn't even have to be a Christian so um, so so but his he's, he's an atheist he believes there's no God he believes all morality for lack of a better word is subjective it's just what we decide it is you know if if we all get together and decide it's all right to to steal or it's all right to rape and pillage and do whatever hey that's fine because it's all subjective it's just what we all agree that morality is there is no um, there's no source of truth there's no absolute truth and and one thing this is going to point out too I hope today is that all of these things go together you can't you know this is that we we kind of have illustrated this sometimes as a four-legged stool you know this is this is the the stool that we stand on that we build on well you know if you have a four-legged stool and you pull out one of those legs it all comes tumbling down so that's sort of the way it is with this um, Dawkins begins with the premise that there there is no book you can trust all the only thing you can trust is what you see with your eyes around you um, the idea of a gospel is repugnant to him if you you listen to the videos that Keith played earlier you know he he just flat out thinks this this idea that the God that created heaven and earth had to die to forgive men of their sins and it's just it's just the silliest thing you ever heard so there is no God there's there's no belief system that he has that accounts for that man is sinful even though he'll, he'll sort of acknowledge that man misses his own mark 
Man sets the mark, sets the standard, and then fails to meet it. Um, study you can understand. If you don't have a book you trust, what's, there's nothing to study. You know, from, for him, study is only observing the world around him, and then ultimately, and that's the point of this, and I just thought this video is so... Um, I went back and looked, and he said similar things before, but this time it was just so clear that what he ends up with in his belief system is, is, doesn't give you a life you can live, and the life he wants to live is the life that we talk about in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. But he doesn't want to admit that that life means anything. So I want, I want Keith to play this video and, and just and listen closely to some of the things he says about... Listen closely to how, some of the things he says... No, I, we already heard that. Um, some, yes, yeah, double talk, yeah. Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So um, listen to what he says about a... He, he's going to use a term... I'm a cultural Christian, which means I want to live in a Christian culture, but then listen to what he says about Christianity. He's going to say, it's all a bunch of hogwash. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's silly. And then he tries to trap this, this reporter into, well, what is she? does she really believe in the virgin birth? Does she really believe in the resurrection? Because she calls herself a little more than a cultural Christian, but maybe not a fundamentalist Christian. So, um, And it's just interesting. These two people... They have no idea about anything trying to, to justify. Well, yeah, we, we all want to live in a culture that is dominated and based on Christianity. But we don't want to admit that anything about Christianity is true. And <coughs> I just thought it was very telling. We had just talked about you got, you, you got to get to a life you can live. And his whole system, and to me in this interview... His, anybody that watches it with a, an open mind has to say his whole atheistic system just comes crashing to the ground in this interview because he acknowledges if you don't have a Christian culture, you've got nothing. Even He even is going to say a Christian culture is far superior to an Islamic culture, which you know, to him it's all, it's all poppycock. It's all BS. It's just, it doesn't mean anything. But he's going to say, well, a Christian culture is better than an Islamic culture. It, even, you know, even though neither one of them means anything. But for some reason, that Christian culture, that's what I want. That's what I want. So just listen to this, and we're going to talk about um, the, the problem with it, obviously, and, and why Scripture has the answer to it. So, Professor Dawkins, it's very good to have you join us to discuss whether it matters that Christianity is playing a diminishing role in national life. Uh, welcome to LBC. Thank you. And what would be your Easter message? I, I mean, I've, I've said a few things. Uh, what, would be, what would you tell the nation? Well, I must say I was slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead. I do think that we, we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm, I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. And so, you know, I, I love hymns and Christmas carols, and um, I, I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. Uh, it's true that statistically the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down, uh, and I, I'm happy with that. But I would not be happy if... Um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Um, so I, I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter if we, certainly if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be tr truly dreadful. Well, which brings um, me to, to my supplementary point, which is that, as we know, church attendance is plummeting. But the building, the erection of mosques across Europe, I think 6,000 are under construction and there are many more, I mean, are being planned. So do you think, do you regard that as a problem? Do you think that matters? Yes, I do, really. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I, I have to choose my words carefully. I mean, I, if I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I choose Christianity every single time. I mean, it seems to me to be a... a fundamentally decent religion um, in a way that I think Islam is not. 
I think you're going to have to explain why you say that, Professor Dawkins. Why is Islam profound, well, pro, the, the way, uh, fundamentally the way the, not decent like Christianity? Yes, I mean, the, 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 the way women are treated. I mean, Christianity is not great about that. It's had its problems with female vicars and female bishops and things. But there's an active hostility to women, which is promoted, I think, by the holy books of Islam. I'm not talking about individual Muslims, who, of course, are quite, quite different. But the, but the doctrines of Islam, the Hadith and the, and the Quran, is fundamentally um, hostile to women, hostile to gays. Um, and uh, I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith. Just for balance, should we should we say something about fundament, fundamentalist Christians who, you know, we can see abortion rights, reproductive rights being rolled back um, in, in, you know, Republican states in America. So Christianity is still not without its problems when it comes uh, to women and their rights. Well, you didn't ask me about uh, about Christianity in, in America. That's a different matter entirely. Okay. All um, right. Well, I'm, I'm but, sure we've got some fundamentalist Christians here, too, but uh, not not as public. Well, insofar as fundamentalist Christians oppose evolution and think that the world was, was created 6,000 years ago, I mean, that, that is pernicious nonsense, of course. Um, right. Well, so I think I see where you come from. I like the phrase, you're a cultural Christian. I think I'm a bit more than a cultural Christian, although, you know, it does, my, my, my belief uh, waxes and wanes. Um, would it be... A good thing or a bad thing if we became a less Christian country? And just on the, you know, the, the foundation of this nation with the king uh, being the head of church and state, um, do you think it provides a solid foundation that we, and we would lose something if, let's say, there was a Muslim majority? Well, yes. Uh, um, I think the king, when he was Prince of Wales, was actually rather sympathetic towards Islam and one of the problems I felt. Um, no, I think it would be a, a terrible thing. Uh, and insofar as Christianity can be seen as a bulwark against Islam, I think it's, it's a very good thing. I mean, in Africa, for example, um, where you have missionaries of both faiths operating, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on team Christian side as far as that's concerned. It's interesting because I sort of thought that you would be more of a Hitchinite, God is not great uh, advocate. But it's interesting to me that you see the value and the force for good of well, the United I mean, Kingdom uh, having a Christian foundation. Yes, but I, I must emphasise that, that I think that, that the, the things that Christians believe are, are actually nonsense. I mean, I, th I think that um, when, you, when you say you, 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 you waver, I, I wanted to ask you, when, do you actually believe that Jesus had a, a virgin for a mother? Do you actually believe he rose from the dead? I, I suspect well, weirdly, you don't. since you ask, since you ask, Richard, if I may, because I was at New College when you were, you were a, a you, I think, yeah. are you still a Don at New College? Yes. Well, I'm retired. But, You're retired, but, but, yes, but you don't look, anyway. Um, weirdly, I was th just three weeks ago at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem where the, uh, the, Christian, the Christians believe that Christ was crucified or there was the tomb and the Gethsemane was just there and Golgotha was there. And I have to admit that there is a real force I mean, it feels like the fulcrum of three world religions. It really does. And Christianity is palpable there. It almost the place pulses with Christianity. Um, I, I don't know whether it made me believe the Bible anymore, but I certainly felt that Jesus was a historical figure. Yes, I, I did believe that. Well, Am I wrong well, yes, to think I mean, that? No, no. I mean, that's that's quite different. But do you believe that his mother was a, was a virgin? Well, I mean... <laughs> Maybe you, that was a mistranslation of <laughs> Well, that's biologically impossible, isn't it? Of course it is, yes. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, I used to make a joke that most second children are virgin births because you can... Know, anyway, we, we yeah, don't want to go into that. Yes. But um, yes, you know what I'm saying. Um, were you pleased that Rishi Sunak talked about Christian values in his... He said Christian values are British values in his Easter message. You seem to be on the same page. 
Uh, yes, I, I didn't hear that. But, but, but that's what but he said. Yes, I, I, I suppose so. But I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I mean, I, I do think it's nonsense. But, uh, but um, the, the, the Christian belief, for the, I mean, today is Easter, and, and of course I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and I don't believe you do either. Um, do you? Do I believe that Jesus rose from the dead? I mean, you're really putting me on the spot. I would like to believe he did. Yes, I, I mentioned yeah, the resurrection. Different. I mentioned the resurrection. By the way, just quickly, because I've been told we've got to stop. When my son, my son was two, uh, we took him to church and um, it, the priest said, uh, you can ask me anything. And he said that my two-year-old son said, asked the priest, do you know Jesus to be true or do you believe Jesus to be true? To be, and then, and do you see what I mean? And he couldn't answer that question himself. Anyway, yes. or God. Anyway, listen, lastly, just one thing. Does it matter, I'm going to ask you again, if Christianity is a minority religion in this country? I think it matters from a cultural point of view. That's a very clear answer from you, Richard Dawkins. Thank you so much for joining us from, I look like New College, but he, uh, Richard Dawkins, Prof Dawkins, is the re renowned ev evolutionary biologist, author of The God Delusion. The, the end, what to me was just classic, priceless. He, she said, do you think it matters if Britain is a Christian nation? He said, well, I think it, it matters that Britain is culturally Christian. And she said, that is very clear. I was like, it's not clear to me what the heck he's talking about. So, but th so the point of that was to illustrate something. We're going to talk about it now. Is so to to get a, a life, a culture, a society that that atheist wants to live in. What kind of a culture does he need? Want? He wants a Christian culture. His it, that's his whole point. Is I'm an atheist. He says several times. I think this is the, all this Christian belief stuff is rubbish. It's nonsense. Virgin birth, resurrection, it's it's all just silly. But I want to live in a culture with people that believe that. He even goes so far as to say I don't want to live in a culture where people believe in Allah. I want to live in a culture where they believe in Jesus Christ, which to me you know, his whole his whole argument just collapses at that point because does his system of atheism give him a, a culture, a society, and a life that he wants to live? It doesn't. He's got to go to Christianity. He's got to go to, you know, he lives in a, the historically a Christian nation. I mean, our forefathers came from there, you know, the Christianity of this country, you know, the, the basic Christianity of this country and England, you know, have have a common source. So he's got to say, I got to go back, but it it all revolves around. So go to go to Philippians chapter two. Let's go to Philippians two. Um, Philippians two is is uh, we looked at this passage just a few weeks ago, but it, it is an important passage. So when you say, I want to live in a culture that is Christian, that is. I want our laws and our traditions and our customs to be Christian, but I don't want any of the stuff that goes with it. And you know, in the video we watched in the earlier service, that well, you know, this whole idea that the God that created, the God that supposedly created the universe, then had to come die because people were sinners. It's just, it's just silly. It's just permit pernicious nonsense is the word that he uses for it which is an interesting term uh, pernicious nonsense Philippians chapter 2 and so Philippians 2 is, is Paul and he's going to talk about the the cross of Christ so if you if you boil down you know once you get beyond creation what is it that these guys just they, they hate the idea of Christ they hate the idea of he talked about a virgin birth well, and, and the commentator says, well, that's just biologically impossible, isn't it? And, oh, well, of course so. I would agree with that. Is it biologically impossible? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're outside of biology now. We're into theology and, and, and spirituality and, and, and another realm of understanding who God is and what he is. So, yeah, it's biologically impossible that a virgin conceived and born son. 
It's biologically impossible that a man rose from the dead. All these things are biologically impossible, but Dawkins is a biological evolutionist. So, you know, or evolutionary biologist, I guess is the, the term they use. So, but Philippians 2 kind of talks about the cross work of Christ in its entirety. Verse 1, and, and, and the lead up to what it says about Christ is, well, in fact, let's see what it says about Christ first. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, speaking of Christ, thought it not Robert to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. It became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So Paul recounts what happened with Christ there, and, and he says beginning in verse 6, he was in the form of God. He thought it not Robert would be equal with God. We've talked about that verse. You know, and people get in all kinds of trouble when they try to add new new word. You know, find a new way to explain verse six and seven. Uh, and you know, the grace preachers have fought. You know, about. So my preference is let's just let the verse say what it says. Verse six says he thought it not Robert would be equal with God. Well, that's pretty simple. If if Jesus Christ says, I'm equal to God, it's not robbing anything from God. If I stand up here and say, if I stand up here and say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, do you have then kind of a warped view of who the Father is? Yes. I'm, I'm robbing something from God. If I, if I say, if I claim that I'm equal with God, and if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, then that's diminishing what God is or who God is. For Jesus Christ to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, did not take anything away from God. It didn't, he thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God. He is equal with God in every way. Um, verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And this is where people get in trouble. Well, well there should be another way to word that. I'm fine with what it, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. What, what reputation does God have? Does he have a good reputation or a bad reputation? He's pretty good, pretty good reputation. He's righteous, he's holy, he's just, he's... You know, all the things that, 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 that the Scripture says about him, that's him. But he made himself, he, that, that reputation that he had, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Who, who does God have to serve? He doesn't have to serve anybody. He's, he's, you know, that's what it is to be God. You don't have to serve anybody. You don't have to answer to anybody. So Jesus Christ made himself a reputation whatever reputation God had he, he, he doesn't have that anymore took upon him the form of a servant he's no longer the master of the universe he's, not the, he's now a servant and he was made in the likeness of men in one of the earlier videos that Keith played in the first service made in the likeness of men is, is man a created being or an eternal being he's a created being so an eternal being takes on the likeness of a created being. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Can you kill God? No. You can't kill God. But the form that Jesus Christ took on allowed him to die, become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we've talked about the death of the cross many times. It was, it was more than just physical death. It was spiritual death. It was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When, when the sins of the world were placed on him. And, and so every, everything that that atheist detests, both in the videos we watched in the first service and in this, everything he detests about Jesus Christ, Paul is affirming here in this passage and you know Keith and Dan and I we have a dis and Bob and have a discussion about well what 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 is it to see something as opposed to believe it by faith so 
you could perhaps see evidence, if you will, that, that Jesus historically existed. In fact, that, that reporter, if you caught it, she said, I believe that, that there was a historical figure named Jesus. And Dawkins says, oh yes, 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 that's fine. Okay, but what do you believe about him? Now you're in the, the realm of faith. So I can believe by, let's say, empirical evidence that there was a man named Jesus. What does it take to believe he was born of a virgin? Faith. That takes faith. You can't, you can't, you can't by evidence see, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, Mary was a virgin. That's faith. You know, so, so there's, there's this, there's a, a physical part to his existence and that is attested to by numerous witnesses in scripture and outside of scripture. But the truth of it, the truth of what Paul says here, he, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, that he, he was equal to God. That's a matter of faith. You believe what that verse says or you don't. And Paul is, is describing this whole process that the atheists hate so much. Because if this process is right, if, if all of this, if, if it's true that the God of heaven and earth became a man to die on a cross for our sins, then what does that mean about, implicitly, what are you saying about us? We're sinners. Does, does an, athe an, an, an atheist, if you listen to all their arguments and all the stuff they do, they will never, ever, ever, ever acknowledge that there's a standard that is set, and if they don't meet it, they are a sinner. They will never acknowledge that, because that's saying something about them, us, mankind. And their whole premise is built on the fact that mankind is basically good. And mankind, you know, or, or there is no morality. It's just whatever happens, happens. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest, if survival of the fittest really works, then if you see someone, you know, fall along the road, what should you do with them? Let them lay there. Run them down. Get rid of the weaklings. Survival of the fittest. See, and if this is true, if Philippians chapter 2 is true, and obviously I believe it is, hopefully all you believe it is, did, does this promote survival of the fittest? Who was the fittest creature, fittest being in all the universe? Was Christ. And yet he, he, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of servant. He was made in the likeness of men, and he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That uh, that's not survival of the fittest. That's an entirely different way of viewing humanity and viewing God. And it's an entirely different way of viewing everything. And the reason that this, he wants, to, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and that ultimately, verse 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So not only did he come to this earth, not only did he die, but he was raised again. Not just raised again physically, but raised again to his position of authority. That, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God the Father. And what else do atheists never want to admit they're a sinner, and they never want to acknowledge by their very name that there is a God. God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. In, in an atheist understanding, is there any name above any other name? No, there's not. This whole passage in Philippians chapter 2 is just, and I love the fact that it's our apostle that says this. Because, you know, it's, it's not, you don't have to go to the, the, the prophets. You don't have to go to the Gospels. All this is in, uh, most of this is in the Gospels. It's there. But our apostle in Philippians chapter 2, in one of his later epistles, says, here's the heart of the matter. And then if you look at the verses surrounding that, and here's where you get to the cultural part. So, so if we accept that to be true, let's look at the verses surrounding it. Verse 1. Why does he even talk about this? Why does he even talk about, you know, Jesus Christ becoming a man and becoming obedient unto death and then being exalted at the right hand of God so that every knee will bow to him and all of that? 
chapter 2 verse 1 if there if there there if there be therefore any consolation in Christ if any comfort of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any bowels and mercies fulfill ye my joy that she be like minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through strife or vain glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves is that survival of the fittest? <laughs> Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now that, that description, right, if, if you want a, like a, just a thumbnail sketch, what is a Christian culture? Right there. That's a Christian culture. A Christian culture is, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look no man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. That's, that's the culture that Dawkins wants. I want people to be kind and generous and loving and giving and forgiving and okay, great. Where, where do you So there it is. That's exactly what is described. So how do you get that? How do you get verse three and four? You go to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Where, where does the mindset that creates a Christian culture come from? Christ. Christ Jesus. The guy that he denies was anything than just some normal guy. You can't... It, <laughs> I mean, this seems self-evident, but he's a really smart guy, and he doesn't get it. You can't have a Christian culture without the basic core beliefs of Christianity. You can't. You just can't. Otherwise, it's just survival of the fittest. That's Darwin's thing. He's a Dar Darwinian evolutionist. That's it. And if you go after that, so, so that's, Paul says all of that. You want a culture like this? Here's how to do it. Let this mind be in which was also in Christ Jesus. Understand what God did through Jesus Christ, and you have that same mindset that Christ had. And then he gets to the end in verse, um, verse 12. So, verse 11, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So where does the Christian culture come? Who, who's working in believers to create a Christian culture? But there is no God, right? So if there is no God, then are you going to have the Christian culture that results when God works in believers to create that culture? You're not. His art, I just can't believe how stupid what he says is. It just, uh, the first time I listened to it, I was like, what the heck is he talking about? And I went back and I've listened to, uh, I don't know, 20 times since the first time I saw it. And, and every time I'm looking for, well, where's the logic that I'm missing here? <laughs> and I can never find that logic that I'm missing. And it just, you know, as I, I listened to him and thought about the scriptures, it's Philippians 2. Philippians 2, Paul zeroes right in on Christ and the work that he did for our salvation. Work out your salvation. He hates the term salvation. Because if you, if you have to be saved, then what's that mean you are? Lost. And if you're lost, why are you lost? Because you're a sinner. And then you have to define sin. Okay, now we have to know who's going to define sin. Well... I guess it gets us back to God. You know, as much as we don't want, as much as we want to get away from God, it keeps going back there, doesn't it? And Paul, he says, uh, verse fourteen: Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Does does Dawkins want a culture without mur one of the things he's talking about there is how you know Islam? They're always you know there's always it's always uh, a chaotic culture. I want a culture that's a Christian with, without all this murmuring and fighting and protesting and chaos. I want that. Well, look, look, shazam, there it is. 
do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as the lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. All of those things are what he wants. All of those things are what he calls a Christian culture. And yet, the thing that's right in the middle of all of that, he, he completely denies. He completely sets it aside. He com he, it's, it's poppycock. It's hogwash. It's, it's pernicious nonsense. So, you are never... At, and, and that's why he can't get here without going back here. He can't get to that life he wants to live, that culture he wants, that society he wants, without going to Philippians 2. But if you go to Philippians 2, you can't say, well, the culture in verse 1 through 4 and verse uh, 12 through uh, 16, I would really like to have that culture. But verse 5 through 11, scratch all that because... <laughs> That's that, that's, that's that Jesus guy they keep talking about that supposedly was born of a virgin, that supposedly rose from the dead, that supposedly died. Scratch all that. I want to keep all the other stuff. Is, is that really a good way to study any book? <laughs> Certainly not your Bible, but any book. You can't say, well, you know, I, I like this paragraph or this paragraph, all that stuff in between where you get to those other things. Just scratch that. So that's why... And this progression, it starts with a book. See, I believe everything that those verses say, not just the part about, well, be nice to each other, you know, but I believe the, the motivation it says for us to look on the things of others, not on things of our. I believe the motivation is look at what Christ did for us. So it starts with a book you can trust. And if I, if I believe what Jesus Christ did there, what those verses say, then, man, there's a gospel I can believe. That's something I can hang on to. That's something I can, under, that's something I can, can, can give me a solid foundation for life. And then I can understand, you know why I should look on the things of others and not on my own things? You know why I should do all things without murmurings and disputings? because Christ did. And I can understand then why I should perform a certain way because my Savior did. And that gets me to a life that I can live. Which, it, and you know, a, a culture or a society is only the sum total of all the individual lives being lived in that culture or society. We talk about, oh, our culture is such a mess and blah, blah, blah. And it is. But who's the culture? <laughs> it's us. It's us. The culture is the way it is because individuals in that culture are the way they are. You know, maybe not us sitting in this room, but, our, but the individuals in general in our culture and our society, it is what it is because of individuals aren't here in this book. And the only way to change the culture and the society is change what people think about this book and what people think about this process. Richard Dawkins is never going to get here unless he starts up here with a book he can trust. So, so you know, we, we need to, and then one other thing I'll say in closing, she, she talks about, he talks about, and she talks about the cultural Christians. And you, you, did you hear how he defined cultural Christian? Well, I, I like the, the Christmas carols that we sing, and, and I like the cathedrals and those nice little parish churches, and I like all that stuff. Okay, <laughs> I like all that stuff. But here's the problem. How many people do you know? So if that's his definition of cultural Christian, well, I like the holidays, and I like the nice churches, and I like the music, and how many people do you know that are cultural Christians? Mm -hmm. We know lots of people, don't we, that are what those people identify as cultural Christians. But if cultural Christianity takes over, 
then you can forget this. You can forget Philippians 2. Because that's what those people are. They're cultural Christians. But many, 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 many people in our culture are cultural Christians. And it's not a good place to be. Because of those verses that we just, and of course we could have gone through lots of other verses. If those verses we just studied in Philippians 2 aren't true, and if we don't stand on them and build, you can't say, well, of course it's biologically impossible that he was born of a virgin. Well, of course, I would like to believe in resurrection, but we all know that's just silly puppycock. No. If, if that stuff is not true, forget about Christianity. Don't try to be a cultural Christian because there is no basis for it. But that's the direct, you know, as I said, Britain is way down further the, the drain than we are in this country. But as I said, just think, how many people do you know in your life, coworkers, friends, family, whatever, that would identify as what those people are, cultural Christians, which is nothing. It's, being a cultural Christian is nothing because it always ends up with nothing. If you don't have this Philippians 2 stuff, you've got nothing. So we need not to be cultural Christians. We need to be just plain old, ordinary, Bible-believing Christians. Let's bow our hearts in our word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we do have a book we can trust. It does reveal to us a gospel that we can believe. If we study it, we can understand who you are and who we are in, in relation to you. And ultimately, it tells us, it teaches us, it instructs us how to live our lives in Christ Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.